how i mean it, there are, there are lots of tools in the toolkit but for a start how does understanding this balance between pain and pleasure provide us with at least a schema of sorts regardless for regardless of just what the addiction is for tackling that addiction yeah i think it provides a schema in the sense that it explains what's going on in the brain and it suggests the intervention, which is to say that we need to abstain from our drug or behavior of choice long enough for those neuroadaptation gremlins to hop off the pain side of the balance and for homeostasis to be restored. So that really is the beginning, the entry point, both uh, to be being able to enjoy other things again uh, beyond our addiction, um, as well as to be able to have insight. Because one thing that's, that happens in the brain as we're chasing dopamine is we lose the ability to see true cause and effect. And we, we really don't see it. I don't like the word rationalization because it, 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 it implies that we're trying to convince ourselves of something when in fact there's no convincing necessary because we really don't see that this substance or this behavior is causing ourselves and or other people harm until we stop for long enough to restore a level balance, kind of get our prefrontal cortex talking to our nucleus accumbens in a way that allows us to sort of see what the gremlins are doing and manage them. So I had a great, uh, I had, I love your cat. and so much fun. Um, I, I'm actually addicted to your cat. <laughs> um, so I had a great uh, reader of Dopamine Nation who wrote in and said that he found the, the, pleasure pain balance metaphor and gremlins so helpful. He was trying to quit smoking and his, whenever he would experience a cravings for a cigarette, he would just imagine those gremlins hopping up and down on the pain side of the balance. He said, I know it's really silly, but I just think I'm going to beat you gremlins. And so I think that kind of frame can be really helpful, especially in a culture that's telling us, you know, you know, pursue pleasure, uh, don't stress yourself out, you know, a rest, uh, eat a cupcake. <laughs> Uh, because what I didn't, what we didn't talk about yet, but which is equally important, is this idea of hormesis, which is to say that intentionally pressing on the pain side of the balance with things like exercise, ice cold water immersion, prayer, meditation, anything that requires effortful investment of you know some physical or mental endurance, will actually get those gremlins to switch over on the pleasure side, and we will reset our reward pathways um, by paying for it. Uh, paying for our dopamine up front. So all of this informs a slightly different intervention to what ails us than if we didn't have this conceptualization of how we process punch root pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With regard to hormesis, I was amazed that one of these patients that you've treated, I think he was, uh, maybe it was alcohol and cocaine or just cocaine, but one of the tools that he used for overcoming his addiction was these cold water baths, at which I know you were on Rogan. Rogan is a, a huge fan of those baths. Uh, but what amazes me about that is how much I absolutely hate them and could not ever imagine uh, loving them. Our brains are all just so different. Yes, you and me both. I actually cannot stand cold water. I have tried and people will say, oh, at first it shocks you, but then the longer you're in it, it starts to feel good. And then afterwards, you know, you get this kind of euphoric high. That is not what happens to me, which again, I think powerfully speaks to the inter-individual variability, how complex our brains are, how there are these basic mechanisms that are similar, but they're slightly tweaked, you know, and slightly different between us, which by the way, is probably also um, an evolutionary mechanism that's advantageous, right? If you had a tribe where everybody was going for the exact same berry bush, that would not be that good an idea. But if you had some people who really like berries and other people who like bison and other people who were looking for, you know, other people, um, that that's a better that that sort of ensures that as a collective you will get all the things that you need. Hmm. Well, okay, so we have hormesis. There is another tool for dealing with addiction. That, I mean. It's really a, a family of tools, probably in the same way that hormesis is, but it's called self-binding. And I hadn't heard that terminology before. I think we're all probably uh, intuitively familiar with the idea, but what is self-binding? So self-binding is a way to 
create both literal and metacognitive barriers between ourselves and our drug of choice so that we can press the pause button between desire and consumption. Um, you know, I use the classic myth of Odysseus, who was traveling through this the channel where, you know, these sort of mermaid-like creatures would sing and, you know, cause the the sailors to shipwreck and die. And so Odysseus said to his crew, I want you to put uh, beeswax in your ears so that you don't hear it, so we can go through the passageway. And he said, for myself, I want you to bind me to this mass, and if I try to break free, bind me tighter. Because he wanted to hear it. And there's an interesting sort of epilogue to that myth that I didn't know but before sort of researching it more closely, which is the reason that Odysseus wanted to hear uh, the sirens was so that he could tell the story about it later. Uh, because the true conquering of any behavior is being able to then narrate that experience uh, as a, a kind of way to understand. That's a deep therapeutic truth yes. there. We're coming full circle to our <laughs> narrative thing. But anyway, what it basically says is that, you know, it, if we rely on willpower alone, we none of us will be successful in this endeavor, especially living in a world that is completely saturated with uh, dopamine releasing substances and behaviors. We must self bind We must create these barriers. And there are a million ways to do it. Not carrying our, uh, you know, our smartphone around with us, deleting apps, um, you know, making it go grayscale so it's less potent not having alcohol or potato chips or ice cream in the house, getting rid of your Kindle so that you can't easily download uh, free you know, pornography from Amazon. Uh, all of these things are ways to like respect that willpower is not an unlimited resource and that we're living in this incredibly um, titillating environment. You know, in some ways, the, pin the pinnacle of capitalism and the capitalist system is to turn us all into addicts. And if we don't uh, push against that intentionally and in advance, we, we will not, none of us make it. Hmm. Well, I pulled up a, another quote from the book, Th this time not yours, but uh, you quoted Immanuel Kant's Metaphysics of Morals. And he, he wrote, when we realize that we are capable of this inner legislation, the natural man feels himself compelled to reverence for the moral man in his own person. And this related to self-binding. And I thought it was a very nice point that self-binding can also promote self-esteem, which I imagine really tremendously furthers its capacity for supporting abstinence and aiding in recovery. Because one, one dimension of addiction that we haven't talked about, but that goes hand in hand with some of those four C's is the sense of helplessness that an addict has, because I know that I certainly felt that. I mean, that's definitive of binge eating. I mean, not being able to control yourself and by successfully self-binding yourself, even though, I mean, self-binding doesn't really have a positive connotation. It doesn't sound <laughs> like a good thing. Except for but, Kant, Kant can turn it into that. Yeah, yeah. But by successfully doing that and mastering yourself, it definitely improves your self-esteem, which is helpful for, for your own efficacy as an agent in overcoming the addiction. Yeah, that's super insightful for you because this comes up all, that's super insightful of you because this comes up all the time in clinical care where patients in recovery will say, I feel like I'm a grown up for the first time. I feel like I can, you know, um, actually express my thoughts and feelings and I don't have to be ashamed of them. There's so much shame, you know, in addiction. Uh, but, but this kind of feeling like, um, yeah, like you're, you know, you, you can rely on yourself and be confident in yourself as an agent in the world. And that all comes with recovery in a really um, powerful and meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And one other binding technique, I mean, I think the drug that you mentioned earlier was bu buprenorphine. Is that how it's Buprenorphine, yeah, it's an opioid. Bu buprenorphine. Yeah, these are all and, very hard to say. <laughs> yes, yes. So there are, I mean, I, maybe it's not self-binding, but it is a 
a bind you might consider it a binding technique but there are some other drugs that you talk about in the book i think uh disulfurium is maybe one of them and then uh now trexone i think was the other and i'm wondering if any of these drugs as i recall maybe now trexone was the one that might best fit this bill if they are effective binding techniques for people who have addictions that are not to very specific substances like opioids or alcohol, whether they can be used for somebody who has a uh, food addiction or a vampire novel addiction or something like that. Yeah, great. So now Trexone is an opioid receptor blocker. Okay, and we make our own endogenous opioids. And when we take naltrexone, we essentially block those receptors. So now Trexone is FDA approved to treat opioid addiction, which makes sense, right? When you're blocking that opioid receptor and you take something like heroin or oxycontin, it can't bind the receptor. In it. It's inert. It doesn't work. Interestingly, it's also FDA approved to treat alcohol addiction because alcohol is partially mediated through our endogenous opioid system. So what happens when people now take naltrexone and they drink alcohol is that they will report that it's not as reinforcing for them. So instead of wanting to drink the whole six pack, they just want one beer and then they can kind of stop. So again, helping them with that appetitive control. Now, Trexone has also been shown to help with cravings for alcohol. And the way that we speculate it works is that even when people get cravings for a drug, they get a little bit high. There's a little release of dopamine, followed by a little mini dopamine deficit state, which drives the cravings. If we block the receptor with naltrexone, that means that thinking about the drug doesn't give as much of that euphoric recall. So that even the kinds of the little high we get from the trigger are reduced, which means that we also don't get into that craving load. And yes, there have been lots and lots of studies looking at naltrexone for other types of compulsive overconsumption, from gambling to sex to food addictions to probably many more um, you know, that I haven't named. It's it's a very it's a well tolerated drug. Uh, there's a lot of inter individual variability in terms of efficacy, even within the approved indications. But for people for whom it works, it tends to be uh, helpful, if even very helpful. What I think is even more fascinating is that naltrexone is being used for some people with chronic pain. So not people are who, who are addicted, but people who have chronic pain, because by binding that opioid receptor, what we're effectively doing is telling our system, hey, we don't have enough endogenous opioids. It's time for the opioid factories to make more. And by doing that, that can like, create a kind of a natural mechanism for pain relief. Hmm. Now, when I spoke with your colleague in psychiatry, David Spiegel, we went into a variety of therapeutic treatment modalities, mainly because we were comparing them with hypnotherapy. But we also compared them to pharmaceutical interventions. And I'm wondering how you see pharmaceutical interventions compared to therapeutic, or th I think you'd probably want to call them therapeutic interventions for addiction, when you would want to use one, when you would want to use the other. And my first guess is if part of therapy isn't just about overcoming this addiction, but also helping the person, you would want to be trying therapy first because maybe going back to Kant again, you're trying to one further self-understanding and then self-esteem. But then at some point, that might just not be powerful enough if there are an, enough and sufficiently ferocious gremlins on the seesaw. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess I'll start by answering, start start by saying that I do probably have a bias or an intuition that something that's hard-earned is longer lasting behaviorally and neurologically. Uh, and psychotherapy and other psychosocial interventions take more time. It's a form of slow medicine. Uh, and so that doing it that way uh, is preferred. Uh, uh, that's my probably my bias, um, but my intuition is that it's it's also more permanent, longer lasting. I want to emphasize, however, that 
Every clinical day of the week, I prescribe medications. I use that tool all the time. And then in the real world, what we end up uh, you know, giving patients is based more on what they're willing to do and what they can pay for or have access to based on their insurance, et cetera, than what we think is the idealized version of what they should and could do. So for example, there are many people that I think would really benefit from psychotherapy. It's very hard to find an individual psychotherapist and it's difficult to pay for that kind of treatment. So then we're kind of stuck with having to use pharmacologic interventions, maybe where it's not even the ideal. In the ideal world, every patient would have access to all of those different interventions, biological and also a psychosocial, because I think at the end of the day, uh, what works for one person isn't going to work for another. And we want to be able to have, you know, to, to fine tune it and individualize it as well as combine. So we'll use, you know, the best treatments are probably the ones that combine the pharmacologic with the psychosocial, especially for the most severely addicted. 